Hi everyone, I think we can start. So my name is Grzegorz Kocjan. I'm a consultant and trainer. I work in software engineering for over a decade. I'm also a father of two young kids. And in my free time, I'm running this website, Be Lazy Dev. It's all about working smart, not hard. It just started, so there is not much, but it will be more. And as a regular developer, I'm working in a project in a company called IndieBI. So today I'm going to talk about Zen of IT, the secrets of sleeping well at night. I wanted to share you a personal story of my burnout and what I learned from that. A few years ago, I was working in an amazing company with a fantastic group of people. And even though everything looks pretty nice, I feel inside overwhelmed, stressed, and sometimes I feel that even I had that depression that time. Eventually, I made a tough decision of quitting my job because I couldn't stand it. And I wanted to get a step back to figure out what get me to that point. Sorry, I didn't put my pointer. So I turned to books, to meetups and podcast, podcasts, and I turned down the problem into smaller pieces. So what are the most important things that help me uh, sleep well at night? Of course, from the IT point of view. So where is my Zen? The first chapter is about our code because it has huge effect on our well-being and we have the biggest impact on it, right? We are developers, we are creating it. So let's start with it. Better code to happier us, right? And the simple hint is start writing stable code. That will solve all our problems, right? So it sounds easy, right? But it's not. It's not an easy thing to write stable code. And I was working in firefighter mode for a long time. I was dealing with light, late night alerts that something has broken and customer was complaining that our system is working slow. That was really, really demotivating. And even if I was not one responsible for communication with the customers, I was hearing their voice eventually. I, were, I, I was able to see what they were talking about our system. That was really frustrating that, but back then. And what's worse, working in firefighter mode, so constantly fixing some bugs, creates a constant context switching. So we are constantly switching from creating a new features to fixing a bugs, and that's not uh, efficient at all. It's mentally exhausting and hinder progress. So what to do to keep our code stable and our sanity intact? Well, we need a well thought and designed architecture. And of course, I see very often that people design architecture, but they are stopping at very high level. So we are designing how our services looks like, how they are split the responsibilities, how they communicate, communicate with each other, how the user flow is between those services. And that's very common. Luckily, uh, we, we live in that time that people care about uh, our microservice architecture. But what we are forgetting is uh, code architecture. And neglecting code architecture can result in tangled mess of legacy code. So even if we have nice diagrams of our architecture, if we don't care about code architecture, so this low level design, it's not enough. So designing code architecture is essential in battle against legacy code and also in our burnouts. 
and it starts this battle starts from the first line of code so my pro tip number one is don't forget about code architecture it's really important design patterns and other like boring stuff are time-tested concepts that long live in our industry for decades. It's, there's nothing new. For like 20 or 30 years, design patterns are the same, and they are the same for the reason. They work. So don't ignore them. Learn them. And what is difficult in using design patterns and code architecture is finding the right balance between having no architecture at all and overcomplicating everything. And it's really difficult because everything depends on our project. Every project is unique and we need some experience to learn what techniques we need to apply for our project to get the most performance. And reading smart books can help us, of course, but we need practice. We need to uh, make our decisions um, based on experience also. And even if we are fortunate enough to make a good decision, there is something very important. Our, over time, all decision became outdated. If you were on the Sebastian's presentation that was on the first slot, he was mentioning that, that we need to revisit our architecture designs every time and it's really important because every decision became outdated over time and we don't know when everything is changing the world is changing we had pandemic it changed everything also in our industry but there are smaller things like business requirements that like people people behavior or new mindset that comes to 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 our society everything in the, de depends on our uh, uh, everything has uh, impact on us, on our industry. So everything can be uh, outdated. But that's not all. Even if we are learning every single day small things, we learn more and we can learn that we did some mistake or some or we can do something better and our decision can be changed. And well, it sounds a little bit scary, but what is comforting is that good code architecture allow us to delay those decisions. So if you are using clean architecture, hexagonal architecture, we can delay important decisions and make them in an informed way. Make them later, at the end of, for example, development, some features. And the outcome of that is also that we can change our decision over time that it became easy. So applying co-architecture helped us in changing decisions in the future. And my next pro tip is that you need to be prepared for changes. That's something in our industry that, that I've, I uh, hear very often that we want specification for something and we want to stick to that specification. That's not good. We need to be prepared for the, prepared for the change and it comes constantly. So we need to design our code in a way that it will be easy to make those changes. That's why we have those design patterns. And for example, clean architecture is saying that uh, with it, we can easily switch the database. So how often do we switch the database in our system? Like once per two years, maybe? Not very often, right? But this approach helps us in every single day work. It creates a more modular, safer to modify code, easier to understand. So it's not only about changing your database every once or twice per year. It's all about having better performance in every single day work. So remember that every day decision made today maybe not valid tomorrow. And it's not only applying to IT guys. It also applies to business guys, to our bosses, to our customers. We all are we all change changing decisions because we are we all learning new things. 
we all having new requirements. And that's normal. And the same pro tip, but in different words, is that we need to learn how to use newest technologies in a way that we will not be binded to them forever. So in a way that we will be able to switch to newer one when they arrived. So prepare for the change. Dinosaur trolls. <laughs> Those are guys, people, for me, that introduces inconsistency in the system. So those are consistency trolls. And I'm using trolls because actually I don't understand how people on purpose introducing inconsistency in their system. Because it is really important and lack of consistency brings confusion. So lack of consistency in naming convention, coding style or design patterns that we are using can lead to confusion, especially for newcomers in our project. So imagine that opening two files and having the same thing is named in a different name, using different naming. Or we have two services that uses different naming for the same thing. Of course, we have bounded context that, that may be OK, but usually that's not the case. We are neglecting naming, and that's a really important thing in, in our industry. So moreover, the lack of consistency makes it difficult to understand the business logic also. It's harder to read the code, it's harder to understand the whole flow, the whole picture, and that brings more bugs, more troubles for us. So caring about consistency is very important. And we need to be consistent not only internally, so within our company to use the same naming and style, etc. It's good to be consistent also with external standards. So for example, in Python, that my main uh, programming language, we have a tool that formats the code in the same way in every single project. That's amazing. It's something is in the Python like for two or three years, but everybody moved to that because that brings a lot of value. Even that such simple thing as code formatting. My another enemy in my daily work is global state. So global, global state is a foe that can disrupt reliable code and hinder peaceful sleep. Why? because it is very difficult to test global state. And with global state, it is really easy to bring new bugs. Because global state is something that can be overused and it is a code smell, right? Everybody knows that and I don't know again why we are constantly using the global states. We shouldn't. So don't use global state at all. Removing global state also from existing projects, so if we have global state and we saw, saw it, we can remove it. And it has a great benefit because it gives us a sweet spot of improvements. It shows us the weak spots of our code architecture. So we are getting back to the first topic, right? Designing our code architecture in a well uh, manner. So removing global states help us in changing uh, the bad code architecture. So um, important notice, sometimes it is not possible to do. Sometimes some libraries, some frameworks are require you to use global state. So do we need to use it? No, we can encapsulate it and problem is also solved. So what do we need more to write stable code? We have code architecture, we, uh, we don't use global state, we are consistent in our naming, we are trying to write nice uh, looking classes, etc. So what, is, what do we need more? For me, it is testing. And importance of testing is undeniable. It's a key component of my Zen, and I hope that for you also. And Good tests boost my confidence in what I do. So I'm not afraid to make changes 
even small or even a big ones because I know that my test st stand my back. They are helping me to make meaningful changes in code, meaningful improvements in the code. So how to write a good test is a really broad topic and I have no time to uh, share with you all the details. Mm, but I have a pro tip for you. Learn TDD. Because TDD forces us to actually write a good test. It is impossible to write a good test at the beginning with bad code architecture. It is also difficult to write a, a good test um, at the beginning if we are not knowing how to do that. We need to learn our testing framework, our architecture, our business domain also. And if you want to start something about TDD, there is a link here, be lazy dev, learn TDD. I posted like a short information how to start and there is a repo on the GitHub uh, there also with uh, my snapshot of my daily work on TDD, how I did it. So there are all comments, what I do, how are all the tiny steps. You can learn from that if you want. So TDD is the second most important metric of this talk. And I call it a metric because like I said, it shows you how good your code architecture is, how well you are prepared. If you are able to do TDD in your test, then that's pretty good. So try to use it and, you, and use it as a metric to point you the weak spots of your architecture, of your workflow, and try to improve that. So it will be ab you will be able to use TDD. And it is difficult. I say you at first. Don't be afraid to fail at the first time. I failed like three times when trying to use TDD, but now it helped me a lot. What's important about TDD is that it not only changes your workflow, but actually it changes how your code looks like. It is proven that when writing t using TDD, writing your code using TDD, you are creating a different kind of code. It is more modular, it is, you create less dependencies, and therefore you are creating more stable code, not only because of the coverage, but because of the modularity. So that's it from this chapter. Next chapter, our workflow. And I will start with a double-edged sword that on, not only affects our customers, but also impacts other teams and as well us also. So what's that? Downtimes. It affects, of course, customers because if our service is not working, they, they are affected for sure. And like before, negative feedback from customers will eventually hit us. We'll hear their voice. But downtimes also disrupt other teams' work. If we are breaking something, everybody is affected, right? Not only customers, because somebody is notified that something is not working, we need to find the root cause. And in many cases, the root cause is, uh, at the first time, it is uh, spotted uh, to the wrong team. So the wrong team uh, is trying to fix the bug and then they are passing it to, to other team. And it really frustrates people when they are dealing with dime times. And what is the scariest part is that it requires an instant reaction, right? So if our service are down, we need to fix them, right? And even if we are planning down times, it is also affecting us negatively. So if we are doing downtime because we are doing because we are doing some big migration, it's, it is also a, a negative uh, effect on us because we are stopping development for others because other teams that rely on our code cannot work. And of course, we are still blocking the customer's work. So that's not good. But it's not only affect others, it also affect us eventually because we need to fix the downtime. And even if we are planning it, 
we need to send a notification, we need to sync up with other teams if we can do that or we cannot do that to find the best spot for downtime. So it requires a lot, a lot of attention for creating a downtime, even on purpose. So I follow the zero downtime approach. I'm trying to write my code in a way that it is possible to always deploy it without a downtime. And I'm trying to use the techniques that helps me prevent unexpected downtimes. So like I said, TDD, for example, right? So um, how to approach, how to uh, also, how to start with zero downtime approach? Well, we need to ship as soon as possible. If we want to avoid doubt times, then we need to ship a little things and we need to ship them fast. If you are running a huge deployment, then there is a risk of downtime. If you are doing small deployments, there is rather small or non risk. So we need to frequently deploy our code. And people usually say that we are shipping every week. That's frequent, right? No. That's far away from being good. And I hear that people are saying that, yay, we are a good team, we are deploying every week. No, you are far away from the goal. So the number of deployments is the most important metric of this talk for me personally. And I use it very often. So it's not the goal like we need to have more deployments. No, but it is a good starting point for improvements. We can ask ourselves a question, what stops us from deploying more frequently? And those are the problems that can affect our software. So if it is hard to deploy something, then probably we are risking that when deploying that, we will have downtime or that our process is not enough. And I tend to receive a question uh, that people ask, how many tasks should I put in single deployments? So how many tasks is enough to do deployment? And that's totally wrong question. The question is how many deployments you want to do for a single task? And for simple ones, it is one. But a for more complicated task, for me, for example, it is three. First, I'm preparing for the change. So if I have old code and I need to add some new database field, I'm preparing old code for this field to be added. Nothing more. I deploy that. Then I'm doing the change. So I'm adding the field to, data, field to database. I'm adding support to fill this field inside the code, doing some migration, second deployment. And it is on the production. And the third deployment is cleanup. So I need to write some backward compatible code. I need to have some migration script that, help that, that for example, was created. And I'm cleaning up at, at the end. So there are like three deployments. And for more complicated stuff, then maybe even more deployments. And we can even deploy some helpers, some small features, uh, like some tools or some refactoring code we can deploy. So there may be even more deployments for every single task. So my pro tip number two is that deploy every single day and not only once. The goal from the book uh, Project Phoenix, they said that it should be 10. So the goal for us should be 10 deployments every single day, even for a small team. It is possible. And it is crucial to ask yourself a question, what stops me from that? And like, of course, it's not like you should do that every single day, but you should be it, should be po it should be possible. So for example, like in my work, we were doing for two weeks a research. We didn't do any deployment at all, but is it wrong? Is it something bad? No, we were not doing, we were, we were just not doing any changes to the code. So it doesn't need to be like metric that we need to have 10 deployments every single day. But we, if we are actually doing some changes in our software, then ship it as soon as possible in a small steps. And to do that, we need automation, right? We cannot deploy our code 10 times every single day if we don't have good CI CD. 
And like with architecture, CICD is something that is a standard right now. I don't found project that doesn't have any kind of CICD. But what is important, like with architecture and code architecture, if we fl with lacking code architecture, CICD has a meaning. It is not like some magic uh, letters. It is continuous integration and continuous delivery. And those are separate things. And of course, not in every case we should separate those things, but in larger projects, in la larger softwares, it is also very important because we need to separate how we are integrating code, so merging and possibly deploying it to the production from delivering the feature to the customers. I see in the agenda that there is a talk about feature flags, and for example, this is delivering. We are deploying the code without enabling the feature for the customers. So we can separate those things. And like in small projects, in small teams, or an early stage, it is not crucial. But at some point, we'll hit the wall that we'll not be able to merge something because we cannot deploy that, because we cannot deliver some partial feature to the customers. We'll be blocked by the business guys. And then we'll create a big feature branch, big release, we'll have big downtime and big troubles. We can avoid that. And if we want to avoid stress, we need also actual refactoring. Why actual refactoring? Not just refactoring, because I see that people took that definition very wrongly. There is a thin line between refactoring and rewriting. If you are planning refactoring, then pro pro most probably you are doing rewriting. So, is refactoring a task or user story? There was a question on Twitter to Alan Holub. Refactoring, by definition, provides no user value. So, it is not a story. Refactoring is not a task either. It is just something that you do continuously as you work, part of development process. This is also what TDD teaches us, that refactoring is a part of development. So we are constantly refactoring and we are constantly improving what we are doing. And in this repo that I mentioned, uh, uh, the, the day of my uh, workday in TDD, uh, I ran some stats and there were like 19 commits uh, with adding some new small features, uh, 19, 19 commits with adding a failing test. So I had a red, red face and a green face. So there was like something like that. And there was almost 40 commits with refactoring. So a huge part of my daily work are small improvements in the code. And if you are doing that on that daily basis, on like hourly basis, then uh, it is much safer. It is much easier. Like it is easier to deploy those changes because uh, we can refactor always. We can refactor a code in smaller uh, pieces. And there is a great book by uh, Martin Fowler co called Just Refactoring that uh, shows you how you can refactor your code without breaking changes. And that's very important. If you are doing ref refactoring and you are breaking something, then most probably you are doing rewriting, not refactoring. So refactor, avoid rewriting. Moving forward, and another important thing of <laughs> that stands in our way of sleeping well at night is observability. So imagine that your boss is telling you, hey, we have a bug on the production and our customers are complaining to me that it's not working. How would you feel about that? I would feel ter terrible that my boss would say me. Of course, I feel a little bit better when I was able to say him, to him that, hey, I already get notification about that. I know the problem. We are aware of that and we are trying to fix it. But what would be even better if, in such case, we'll be able to tell, tell our boss that, hey, we know about this bug and the production is already fixed. And we can do that. We, 
if we have frequent deployments every single day, 10 times 10 deployments every single day, if we are using TDD because we have a great code coverage and we can easily reproduce the bugs in the test, and if you have that, we can easily fix it. So those are very important things and they are all connected together. So the perfect solution, of course, would be if our boss would not even know about downtimes or some bugs in the production. And for that, we need a very good observability. We need to know instantly that something is wrong. And we need to act fast because sooner we will know about the bug or some issue, the easier it will be to fix it. Why? Because of context switching. If we are deploying some feature like at the beginning of this year, it has a bug and we don't know about it for like a month or two and we get notified by the customer that something is not working, we need to go back to the past. We need to switch the context to that task and try to fix it. It is time consuming. But if we instantly get notification that, hey, something has broken after deployment, after small, tiny deployment, then we can easily, without context switching, because we are constantly in this small context, we can fix it. And it is much, much easier. We need less effort to do that. And in case of observability, my pro tip is that our staging environments should be better monitored than production. And that was mind blow that, that when my friend told me that, that they are following that approach. And I asked, why? Because we want to fix problem as soon as possible. We want to learn about the problem as soon as possible. So the perfect solution is when we are developing the code and we are learning that something is wrong on our, on our computer using tests. So that's why we are using TDD. But if the bug slips through the test, because that's always possible, we want to learn that something is failing at staging, right? We want to break the system for all our colleagues, for all the company, but still only internally. And we want to that notification. That's far way better from destroying production for customers, right? We only are stopping work for other teams. So we need to have better monitoring of staging environment than on the production. And if we are getting some notification about errors, don't ignore them. If we are ignoring errors because our system <laughs> just work, con continue to work, we don't know when it will stop. There is some kind of threshold of errors that will allow our system to continue to work. But we don't know what the threshold is. And I don't want to gamble on that. I want to fix all the issues, all the problems on the production and on the staging also, because I don't know when it will break the system totally. And of course, we need to write our code so when something will happen, it will try to work correctly. So we need to do some try accepts, we need to do some retries, etc. But we cannot rely that on that on a daily basis. We cannot rely that, okay, there are those errors happen every single day. We can live with them. Because someday it will stop. And if we it will stop and we'll have like a huge list of errors every single day, we'll not know which one of them is causing the problem. And what's worse? it is very highly possible that all of them are causing the problems because they are stacking on each other. <laughs> so don't ignore errors. And all of those practices, all of this will always be more expensive than today. So introducing code, ar code architecture, CICD, automation, infrastructure as a code, TDD, observability, all of that will be more expensive to introduce in our system, in our project, in our company, in every new line of code. And of course, you don't have to start with everything. You don't need to do every single step before writing any new, 
line of code. So we don't need observability without any code. But you need to decide, you need to make a conscious decision when you will start monitoring your system, when you want to automate deployments, when do you want to have TDD in your project. And you need to decide when. So last chapter, our company level. And if we are talking at company level, I have for you only one thing, and it is the one thing book. So it is crucial to focus on one thing at a time. As Richard has shown, we are really bad at multitasking. It slows us down. So honking on a single task can deliver can end up with delivering more features over time if we are focusing on a single thing. But it's not just about focusing on anything, any one thing. It is important to focus on the right thing. And that's that that and this is the main topic of this book that we need to find what is exactly the ma one most important thing that we should focus on, the features, etc. And this is on our organization. This is our organization level responsibility. And determining the right thing can be very challenging because we need some data to make informed decision, and that's difficult to gather this data. We need to talk to our customers. We need to interview them, we need to talk with our developers, with business guys, with a lot of people, and it takes a lot of time. But if it is a part of our culture, it can be really, really easy over time. It can become in our blood and blood. And even if we gather all this data and make some good decision, we need to check if we were actually right. So after deploying some feature, we need to verify if actually customers are using it because they were maybe lying to us, maybe not on the purpose. Like I said, they changed their mind or they, they behavior has changed uh, over like few days. It can happen. So we need to verify if we are correct and we need to learn from that. That's it. So those are three areas that affects my Zen my code, my workflow, and my company. And everything must work together correctly. And Zen is a continuous effort. So it's not a one-time task. The practices, the old practices that we discussed today, require constant, constant improvements and refinements. And we need to do small baby steps every possible thing. So if you are doing merge request, it needs to be small. Even one line of code is good enough to do a merge request. Really? If you are planning a story, it should be small. We cannot add payments to the system. It's not a good story. Divide it in smaller pieces. Why you want to do that, that? What is the outcome that you want to achieve so user can pay for the basket? Okay, so let's focus on that maybe at one payment, not like the every possible payment in the world, right? And deploy small things. As I said, deploy multiple times for a single task. It is possible and it is quite easy when you learn it. And if we are introducing observability, we cannot also like do it one time and forget because our system is changing. We are getting new bugs. Our behavior of customers also is changing. So the performance of different uh, services can be affected. And we need to also constantly refine our observability. And by embracing the philosophy of small incremental steps, we can ensure that we are constantly moving in the right direction. So practice makes you master. And I really love this quote. You have to finish things. That's what you learn from. You learn by finishing things, said Neil Gaiman. And this is why I that I'm saying that dividing everything into smaller pieces is very crucial because we are learning from every single of those small steps. And 
we cannot learn from creating a huge merge request, huge feature branch for over two months without deploying it to production. We are learning in IT when we are deploying the feature and when we are de delivering it for the customers. That is the phase when we are start learning from that. So it is only possible when we divide things into smaller pieces, when we have frequent deployments, and of course, when we gather some feedback for customers. It doesn't need to be like manual. We can analyze what clicks are, what you, our users are clicking, for example, and see if they are using or not our features. And we can learn from everything. And practice on simple things. You don't need to learn from like changing the whole architecture of your system. You can learn from refactoring one single function. You can learn from that. You can learn how to do it better next time. So, if, oh, where is my slide? Here, okay. So, 90, uh, sorry, 69 thing that every programmer should know is put the mouse down and step away from the keyboard. If you can sleep at night like I did, if you feel overwhelmed, if you feel stressed, put the mouse down and step away from the keyboard. Like not to quit the job, but to think about why it is happening. What is the root cause? Is it in our code? Is it in our workflow? Is it difficult to deploy something? Do we have frequent bugs that causes our disruption? Or our user stories are bad? And we have a really huge impact on all of those things. So we are responsible of thinking that and saying it out loud that we can fix it and we have a solution for that. Because on the internet, like I said, design patterns, code architecture are there for decades. Just need to, we need, just need to take them. So we need to think. And we need to think in the calm in the piece, outside of the computer. So that's it from my side. Uh, if there are any questions, you can ask. You can also catch me on the email, on LinkedIn, Instagram. I'm doing training and wor workshops on Python, TDD, and DevOps. And if you like this talk, please rate it. If you didn't like it, do it also. So thank you very much. <laughs>